Good morning. Before we uh, open up God's Word together, I have one uh, additional announcement for you. Uh, this just came to my attention uh, this week, that this evening at uh, the First Baptist Church of Hope Valley, uh, that's obviously where Pastor Jim Menzies is serving now, uh, there's going to be a Light Dawns in the Darkness winter concert at 6 o'clock. Um, this will just be an informal time of being able to worship the Lord together and to hear um, ministry through song. Uh, there are three local Christian musicians that are partaking in that or leading us in that, one of them being our very own Paul Mills. So afterwards, uh, there will be a love offering taken and some refreshments. So if you don't have any plans for this evening, uh, I would encourage you to, to go out to First Baptist Church in Hope Valley to support Paul and uh, just to enjoy that time together. I want to encourage you to find the sermon notes inside of your program and take them out as we study God's Word together this morning. And as we begin, I want to you to imagine the following scenario with me. Jack mentions an upcoming golf trip to his wife, Rebecca, having forgotten that her mother's birthday party is the same weekend. Rebecca is appalled that he would even ask. She's mentioned the party to Jack multiple times, and he knows how important birthdays are to her mom. Yet, Jack is unwilling to back down. In a not-so-pleasant tone, he tells Rebecca that he goes to his mother-in-law's birthday party every year, so it's no big deal if he misses this one time. In her frustration, Rebecca yells at Jack, telling him that he always puts his friends before her and the rest of the family not wanting to go down that road again because they've had this argument many times before, Jack storms out of the house, gets into his car, and drives away, leaving yet another marital conflict left unresolved. Now, this hypothetical situation leads us to ask the question, why do we do the things that we do? Why did Rebecca yell at Jack? Why did Jack storm out of the house? Why do conflicts occur? Why do we do the things that we do? And this morning, we are resuming our study of the book of James. And in today's text, James is going to answer that question for us. He's going to tell us why we do the things that we do that lead to conflict. So if you have your Bibles, please open them with me to James chapter 4. And that would be page 827 if you're using one of the Bibles here in the auditorium that are under the chair. We're going to be looking at just three verses this morning. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Follow along as I read these verses. James asks this question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. This passage is relevant not simply for those who are married. This passage is relevant to everyone. It's relevant regardless of your age. It is relevant regardless of whether you're male or female. It is relevant whether you are a parent or a child. It's relevant because we are all familiar with the harsh reality of relational conflict. And perhaps you are in the midst of relational conflict right now. If so, this passage that we're going to study together this morning, when understood and applied correctly, 
can be a difference maker in resolving conflict. So you're going to want to pay attention. And if you don't presently find yourself in an unresolved relational conflict, well, there's one awaiting you in the future. And I'm not talking about your, your distant future. I'm talking about your immediate future. Conflict is coming whether you like it or not. Now, sometimes we uh, idealize the early church. We think it must have been great to be part of the, the first century church. It, it was so dynamic and powerful. They had such sweet fellowship with one another. But the reality is the early church was made up of people, and people haven't changed over the centuries. Many, if not all, of the first century churches wrestled with conflict between their members. Even amongst the scattered Jewish Christians to whom James wrote, it is clear from his letter that all types of conflict were happening among them. There were class conflicts, such as the rich being honored and the poor dishonored in the worship gatherings. There were work conflicts, as the rich were withholding wages from the poor. There were leadership conflicts, as people were selfishly striving for teaching and authority positions. And obviously, there were relational conflicts, as people were slandering and speaking evil of each other. We have a chapter break between chapter 3, verse 18, and chapter 4, verse 1. But the reality is that the fights and quarrels James refers to in chapter 4 flow from the worldly wisdom that was permeating the community of faith in chapter 3. In fact, the word covet in chapter 4, verse 2 comes from the same Greek word James used in chapter 3, verses 14 and 16, for envy. James illustrates, in the beginning of chapter 4, the disorder and evil that is the result of the envy and selfish ambition that he's already talked about in chapter 3. So what is the source of your conflict, James asks? And if I were to ask you that question, you would probably say, that's easy. And you'd point your finger at whoever you're having the conflict with. They are. That's the source of my conflict. The problem is with the other person. And for those of you who are married, if I asked you to identify the main cause of your conflict, your, your marital conflict in a counseling session, what I probably hear is him or her. And then the other spouse would start rolling their eyes and shaking their heads until they get a rebuttal. And eventually, one of you will get up and walk out mad. You see, many people would say, most of the unhappiness and strife and conflict in my life is there because of you, spouse because you don't think about my feelings or my needs. Or it's because of you, boss, because you never think about the implications that your decisions have upon me, and you never seem to appreciate my efforts. Or it's because of you, child, because you're ungrateful, and you think you're smarter than me and everybody else in your life, and you want the whole world to revolve around you. Or it's because of you, mom and dad, because you control me too much. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Do you get my drift? The reason that I experience conflict, we think, is because of you, we would say to somebody else. You're the problem. But the Bible describes the root cause of conflict as something else. The Bible tells us it's because of unmet desires in our heart. Look again what James said in verse 1. He asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers it with another question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The cause of the conflict is not someone else. It's within you. It's within you. 
Conflicts don't create sin. Conflicts reveal sin. And what does conflict normally reveal? Conflict reveal a certain unmet desire. If you look underneath an unresolved conflict, you're going to find an unsatisfied craving. It's really not that complicated. (laughs) Why do we fight? Because we don't get what we want. That's why. There's nothing complicated about it. Why do we fight? Because we don't get what we want. That's the root issue. There's nothing deeper than this. And so the answer to the question, why do I do the things that I do, is answered by this statement, because I want what I want. That's why I do the things that I do. Now, I think that we would agree that not every desire that we have is sinful or wrong. So how can we determine when our desires are sinful? Well, one obvious answer is when we desire a sinful object. That is when the item itself is forbidden in Scripture. To want something that is intrinsically evil or explicitly forbidden is, of course, sinful. And so if I were to want something that you possess, then that would be a sinful desire, especially if I'm tempted to take what is yours so that it can be mine. Another sinful desire would be to have an adulterous relationship with someone or to get drunk or high as a means of escaping the problems of life because those things are either intrinsically evil or explicitly forbidden in Scripture. But you need to know that a desire can also be sinful when it's an inordinate desire. In other words, it is possible to desire a good or legitimate thing too much. The problem is not always in what we want. Sometimes the problem is that we want it too desperately. It's not what we want, but how much we want it. That's the problem. So what are the kinds of things, perhaps good things, in and of themselves that can rule our hearts? Well, here's several of them. A husband who loves me as I am, unconditionally. A wife who will fulfill me sexually. A son who achieves good grades and excels in sports. A daughter who wants to be my best friend. A dad who will spend time with me. A mom who will make my lunches and wash my clothes. A boss who notices me, appreciates me, and commends my work. A teacher who grades me fairly a coach who will make me a starter on the team, a roommate who picks up their clothes and cleans out the kitchen sink, a neighbor who will muzzle their barking dog. And what do you notice about each of these desires that I've mentioned? None of them is inherently evil. In fact, most, if not all, are things that God would want the other person to give. The problem is not that these desires are evil. It's that they have become heart-controlling desires. And when we demand these things, conflict will surely arise. So here's a key principle to keep in mind. A desire for a good thing becomes a bad thing when that desire becomes a ruling thing. James says that these desires battle within you. The New American Standard Version puts it this way, they wage war within our members. We don't typically think about our desires waging war. We think of powerful or wrong desires, but we must understand the war metaphor James is using here. If a war is being fought between nations, it's fought for geographical 
or political control. Control is the purpose of every war. So it is with our desires, which fight for our control, the control of our hearts. And what controls our hearts will exercise inescapable influence over our lives and our behavior. The heart of every person is a fount of competing desires. We rarely do anything with one simple motive. Most of the time, there's a battle within. For example, let's say that you're driving home after a long day at work. You can't wait to see your family, but you would also like to go for a run. You want to be a good parent, but you would also like to take some time to get a head start on tomorrow's meeting at work. The desire that wins will shape your behavior when you get home from work that night. If above all else that you want to take a run, but as soon as you get home, <laughs> your wife asks you to go to the store to get something that she needs for dinner, then you probably will not respond the best way when asked. And here's why. Whatever rules your heart will control your behavior. It's a fact. It will. James goes on to say in verse 2, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. The sentence structure of this verse places the emphasis on the fact that frustrated desires lead to conflict. Now remember, James is writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. So kill here is probably not literal. It's metaphorical. He's talking about murder the way that Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus equates anger with murder. In this case, this is when you're raging at someone and you desire to hurt them. So James says the rage in your heart comes from the fact that this person that you're angry with kept you from something that you wanted. So if my heart is ruled by a certain desire, there's only two ways that I can respond to you. If you're helping me to get what I want, then I'll be happy with you. I'll treat you well. I'll allow you into my world. But if you stand in the way of what I want, then I'm going to be angry and frustrated and testy when I'm with you. There will be times when I wish that you weren't even in my life. You stand in the way of what I crave, and so I lash out at you, or I push you away, or shut you out. It's the only two responses that I can make when my heart is ruled by a certain desire. And again, James says you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Coveting is when we want something so badly that we think that there's no way that we can be happy or content without it. You understand that, that coveting is a form of idolatry. You believe that you need this thing or that thing to be happy or content. And because you think that this person is keeping you from it, you rage at them or seethe at them and, and punish them with your silent treatment. In his book, The Peacemaker, Ken Sandy lays out for us the progression of an idol. He says it, it goes this way. It begins with, I desire. And that desire quickly turns into, I demand. Which then leads to, I judge. And finally, I punish. And so it works this way. While my initial desire might be legitimate, it becomes sinful when it becomes a demand. And when it becomes a demand and you don't meet it, and of course you can't meet every one of my demands, I then judge you in my heart and I condemn you. And then in the final step, my internal judgment produces some outward expression of punishment toward you on the behavioral level. I might yell at you, speak sarcastically about you, gossip about you, or just avoid you 
altogether. I like what Pastor Brad Bigney said. He says, the problem really isn't your spouse or someone else. It's a heart problem. We've all got heart problems. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The real problem under the surface of our conflicts is that two kingdoms are colliding. What's ruling your heart and what's ruling my heart are meeting head on. And we both can't be king at the same time. We have all kinds of legitimate desires, but nothing is supposed to control our hearts such that without it, we despair or become deeply discontent or rage at someone else. So find out what you've been craving lately. Then look at where you've been having conflict. The two are not unrelated. Now, how do we know when a legitimate desire has become a ruling desire? There's three things that I want to suggest. Number one, we know that a legitimate desire has become a ruling desire when it consumes my thoughts. And so we need to ask ourselves, do I obsess about this thing? Does my mind drift to it when I don't have to think about other things? Like when I'm taking a shower or taking the dog for a walk or driving to work, does it consume my thoughts. We also know that a legitimate desire has become a ruling desire when I'm willing to sin to get what I want. And so we need to ask ourselves these questions. Do I manipulate people or situations to get what I want? Do I bargain, nag, or try to guilt trip? And third, we know that a legitimate desire has become a ruling desire when I respond sinfully when I don't get what I want. So we should ask ourselves these questions. Do I pout or explode or pull away or gossip about someone when he or she doesn't give me a desired thing? Listen, it's not wrong to desire relaxation at the end of a long day, but it is wrong to be ruled by relaxation to such an extent that I'm angry with anyone who gets in the way of me and my relaxation. Ladies, it's not wrong to desire the tender affection and attention of your husband, but it is wrong to be so ruled by that desire that your days are filled with bitterness, manipulation, and depression because your desire isn't getting met. Guys, you're not off the hook. It's not wrong to desire esteem and respect from your wife and other people in life. But it is idolatry to live every day with a hypersensitivity and demand for it that either spirals into depression or explodes in anger whenever your path crosses someone who doesn't give you the respect that you think that you deserve. So here's the question that each one of us needs to ask. What is it that I want bad enough that I'm willing to yell at, tune out, abuse, or neglect someone else to get? James concludes this passage by saying, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So here's what James is saying. He's saying when we allow the desires of our heart to go unchecked, the result is a lack of answer to prayer, either because we have become so engrossed in fulfilling our desires by our own means, and so do not come to God in prayer at all, or because we come to God treating him as the means to our ends, and therefore we pray with ungodly motives and intentions. When you don't see many answers to your prayers, maybe the problem is with your prayers. They may be inappropriate prayers that reveal the inordinate desires that are ruling your heart. James chapter 4 
verses 1 through 3, provides a key principle for understanding and resolving relational conflict. Whenever we have a serious dispute with others, we should always look carefully at our own hearts to see whether we are being controlled by unmet desires that, uh, that we have allowed to become controlling or ruling desires. Just a couple applications for us to consider as we finish our time together around God's word. The first application is this. Your one ruling desire should be to know and glorify God. That's it. That should be your one ruling desire. That should be mine as well. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 3, now this is eternal life, that they, and he's talking about everyone that the Father had given him, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And for those of us who already know God in the sense that we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and we are in right relationship with God, we shouldn't be satisfied with the level of knowledge that we have of God today. We should always be pursuing him more, desiring to know him more and more and more. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, that uh, our ruling desire also includes this idea of glorifying God. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, but when all of life, do it all for the glory of God. Do it to please him. Do it to honor him. Do it so that he looks good to others. Whenever we treasure things of this life more than the God of eternal life, we will find ourselves wanting things of this world too much. The result is that we will place our hopes in the temporal pleasures of this life rather than the pleasures found forevermore in Jesus Christ. And so we need to make our one ruling desire to know and to glorify God. A second application, examine your heart to identify inordinate ruling desires. How can we determine what desires are ruling our hearts? Let me give you a very practical exercise. When you get home today or, or maybe later this week, I actually want to encourage you to do this, to do this assignment. And it will really include three steps. The first step would be this. Write down those things that are most important to you. Whether it's on a legal pad or you can use your phone, the notes app on your phone, but write it down somewhere. That may include such things as a loving spouse, obedient kids, the respect of others, job security, good health, you, you name it. What is it that is most important to you? And, and if nothing or very few things come to your mind right away, maybe you can get to that answer by answering this question or finishing this sentence. What I really want out of life is fill in the blank. Whatever you fill in the blank with, that is what you value most in life. That is what is most important to you. So with this assignment, do that first. Write down those things that are most important to you. Step number two in this assignment, write down the ways that these desires have affected your relationships. In other words, you might want to ask yourself this question, how have my desires, the things that I've said are most important to me in life, how have these desires affected my relationships with other people for the good or bad? And you really want to focus on the bad because that's what's showing you uh, what desires have become ruling desires in your heart. So the third step would be this. When God reveals to you the ruling or inordinate desires in your heart, you need to confess them to God. Confess that they are a sin, that they have become an idol to you. 
whatever this good thing is, this legitimate thing is in and of itself, it has become a ruling desire, something more important to you than even your relationship with God himself. And so you need to confess that as a sin to God and repent of it, which means that you you do what is necessary to put Jesus back in his rightful place within your heart, where he is the one uh, that is ruling your heart. He is, the, the again, the desire to know him and to glorify him. Do what you need to do where that becomes the ruling desire of your heart. And if you know that you have mistreated others in your sphere of influence, somebody in your family, a close friend, could be a coworker, could be a student, could be a neighbor, that you've mistreated them or sinned against them because this desire has become a ruling desire, then you may have to go and confess that to them as well as a sin and ask for their forgiveness. And if you will do these things, you know that God will forgive you for your idolatry. And he will not hold that sin against you. And he will allow you to have a clean slate in your relationship with him and your sweet fellowship, intimate fellowship with him can be restored. But what also can happen is when, when we are willing to confess our sin to others that we have sinned against because of these inordinate desires and we ask for their forgiveness, it can lead, not necessarily will, but it can lead to a reconciliation of the relationship. Again, I like what David Paulison, a Christian counselor who's now with the Lord, but he says this, that couples who see what rules them, cravings for affection, attention, power, vindication, control, comfort, a hassle-free life. Couples who see what rules them can repent and find God's grace made real to them and then learn how to make peace with others. In the opening scenario I presented, Jack and Rebecca experienced marital conflict because both of them had unmet desires. Jack wanted to go on a golfing trip with his buddies but Rebecca wanted Jack to accompany her to her mother's birthday party. Neither of these desires were sinful in and of themselves, but it's evident that they had become inordinate ruling desires because both Jack and Rebecca sinned against each other when they thought that they weren't going to get what they wanted. And if Jack or Rebecca were to confide in a family member or friend, they probably would have blamed their spouse for the conflict that occurred. But it takes two to tangle. If just one of them, if, just, if, if either Jack or Rebecca had chosen to examine their heart for a ruling inordinate desire and then replace that desire with a desire to glorify God, the conflict could have been either avoided or resolved. And whether the conflicts that you are experiencing are at home or at work or at school or at church or in the neighborhood in which you live, you can resolve conflict by choosing to look within and to address the sinful, inordinate desires that are ruling your heart. And when glorifying God becomes your one ruling desire, you can work through problems. We're not talking about having a problem-free life or that the, uh, getting to a point that there are no problems in our relationships with other people. We're talking about being able to work through problems without them turning into a fight or into a greater conflict. That can be our reality when we're willing to take a look inside and see that the root of all conflict is me, is me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this very practical passage of Scripture.
asking a very relevant question to our lives. What is it that causes fights and quarrels among us? There's not a person in this room that has not experienced some type of relational conflict in their life. And my guess is many here today are experiencing that kind of conflict right now. Whether that be with somebody in their home, with a friend, co-worker, a fellow student, somebody in their neighborhood. And maybe they have found themselves when talking about this problem with others saying, the other person, they're the problem. If they would just change, if they would just do this or that, then everything would be better. And we've seen from this portion of scripture today that that is not the place that we are to start. We are to start by looking at our own hearts and the desires that are ruling our hearts. And we have seen from this passage of scripture that uh, when a desire for even a good legitimate thing becomes a ruling desire, then that becomes an idol that often will prevent us from doing what you would want us to do in a given situation. And so, Lord, if that is us, may we repent, confess that as sin, repent of it, turn back to you. And Lord, we have to admit that naturally speaking, none of us here are going to say that the one ruling desire of our heart is to know you and to glorify you. Because we, we still battle with a sin nature that really looks out for number one, looks out for ourselves. And so, Lord, we need you to develop that kind of heart within us. If, if there's this war that's going, in, or, or going on inside each one of our hearts, a war that's constantly choosing between glorifying self or glorifying you, we're going to turn, we're going to give in to the desire that's the greatest. And so we need you to work in our hearts so that our ruling desire is to know you and to glorify you. And we ask that you would do that in each one of our hearts today.